All right. Well, I'm here with Caitlin and Urban today, and we're going to talk about Windows XP and other things. But first, the top story, which will be a great interest to one of our listeners I'm aware of, uh, the Windows XP activation algorithm has been cracked. So even though Microsoft apparently no longer runs Windows XP activation servers, you could run your own and generate a key and validate it. So that does, will... that, does that also work with other older ones? I do not know. I don't think you had to activate any of the older ones. I mean, Windows 2000, you just had to have a key and you can use it on as many machines as you want. Windows XP added the online activation with the Windows Genuine Advantage in Service Pack 1 or 2. That's so right. That's right. Yeah, so... In earlier days, product keys were just, you know, on the box with a piece of tape. Like, I remember Office had one key and you could put it on a thousand machines. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's exciting. I got to play with that. Well, I, I'm I'm glad you feel that way. You know, I this reminds me, I've got some uh, vulnerable machines for my really old projects that use Windows 2008. And I keep getting share requests from like India to download my Windows 2008 machine to hack it. And I approve it, but I really don't recommend <laughs> hacking Windows XP and Windows 2008 anymore. I think it's not terribly relevant. But anyway, there are people doing it. <clears throat> I mean, XP is still online. People still use it. Uh, yes, I, I hope I hope you get a good antivirus, at least. I've heard people, I read a, uh, this article about it, and they said, you know, you really can't get much done with XP. If you run Internet Explorer, you can't even open Microsoft.com anymore on any version of Internet Explorer supported by Windows XP and so on. So anyway... There are some people that love Windows XP. I know one of them. Anyway. Yeah, uh, no, and and yeah. I do want to point out that if you do love Windows XP, oh, you're going to love, um, well, oh, what's it called? The the open source Windows. Um, it used to be Lindos. Not Lindos. Uh, oh, why is it? Uh, React OS? React OS, yes, React OS. So React OS has been slowly getting towards Windows XP compatibility over over decades. And it, it's sort of almost there. It has theming at this point. Uh, so if you like Windows XP and want something that'll like have Firefox that will actually like run and get you to like modern internet, React OS is the way to go. Why why aren't they shooting to be compatible with like Windows 10 or something? They're really shooting oh, XP still? They, they are. It's just Microsoft is always so far ahead of them mm -hmm. that, I mean, before it was like, they're going to be compatible with like, Windows 3.1, then it was like Windows 95, and then it was like Windows 2000. Now they're like XP, you know. <laughs> that reminds me of Open Office. I mean, I used to be a real power user of Microsoft Office at my company, and I tried using Open Office, and I said, this is like Microsoft Office 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. And and that that's how it is in the open source world, is that the the open the the commercial software is always like way ahead and has the newest features. The Open source software is what the commercial software should have been 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyway, and even Microsoft Office had all these advanced features I was using, but clearly the designers of Open Office didn't think of that and were just making like home user site features. Well, I mean, the there it is when you're working with volunteers, you know, you don't, you know. Yeah, yeah, you get whatever's fun for them until they have what they want on their machine and then they stop. Yep. They don't have a manager like, motivating them to do the dreary stuff of adding 100 features that you're not going to use. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And you've got an underground robot. Yeah. So this sounds very unappetizing. <laughs> Wendy's is going, to be, is going to be is going to be delivering food via like underground robots and like tubes. Like if you've if you've seen Futurama, you know you know the people take those pneumatic tubes like around. Well, when you used to have those things, you'd put a note in a, in a tube. I think submarines have them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like banks used to have them. You'd, you'd like the mnemonic tubes. You would you'd put the. But it's not your... even a robot. It just has pressurized air or something. Right, but this is this is going to be it's supposedly robotic because there's going to be like multiple endpoints or something. I don't know how it's going to work, but <laughs> but it's you know sending your food down this thing where some of it's going to get stuck on the walls. And I don't. It sounds like a really bad idea. But well, when you these... put the food in a container. <laughs> Do you really trust it after like a year that like none of the food's going to spill out in the middle of the underground thing where no one can get to to fix? And, I guess and... you'd have to send in a scrub robot with a brush to scrub it now and then. Yeah, I guess. I don't know how it's, it's going to work, but they're going to try it. So um, this may be the new future. So back in the 19, like 40s and 50s, uh, there were these diners where you would take your car and they would 
these people would come out and deliver your food to your car, and it was awesome. Well, they uh, had them in the '60s. I've been they had those. them in the '60s. Yeah, yeah, but they they went away. But apparently, they're they're kind of coming back. Uh, but this time in robotic format. Um, and they're doing it on Wendy's of all <laughs> damn places. Well, you know, if they made a robot <laughs> with wheels that wheeled around the parking lot bringing your order, that would actually be cool. That would, that be, would be cool. But this is this is underground. So so it's going to be um let's see, it, it's called uh, it's called Pipe Dream. And it's going to be an underground robot system that delivers orders to your car. And you see there's a picture on this page. By the way, this is on USA Today. This is written by Celine Martin. I did not do any research for this. This is all Celine. Thank you, Celine. Uh, <laughs> um, and there are these apparently like these boxes. So what happens is apparently the people at Wendy's are going to make your food, send it underground under God knows what conditions, send it up to these boxes where you can just get it from your car and then pull away. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love the name, Pipe Dream. Yeah, um, yeah. It's we'll see how this works. We'll see if it if it catches on. I mean, it could be better than the drive-through. It also could be much worse. We'll see. Well, you know, I'm here. I am dropping another million-dollar idea for free. I think what they should do is get a laser-guided T-shirt cannon and just shoot your hamburger through your through your window. Oh, that'd be awesome! Yeah, I know. No, no, no. Drone delivery from the Wendy's kitchen to your vehicle. But you gotta, it, you know, no, no, it should be able to just park in the parking lot anywhere. And it should be yeah. able to find you and then. I know, yeah, exactly. And your shakes too, your burgers <laughs> and your shakes. <laughs> yeah, you probably have to put a tighter lid on the shakes. But the same yeah. principle. I kind of think of it. What are the shakes going to do in this underground pneumatic tube? That would be that's great. What... You get your hamburger, the shake has exploded all over it. I, that's what I'm saying. Like you just have one accident down there. How the hell are you going to clean it up? Like... And, and how about hot coffee? Yeah, now that you mention it. I'm beginning to have more doubts about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see how this works. All right. We'll see. I'm skeptical. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I'm skeptical too. But hey, experimentation. Yep. Yeah. All right. And Irvin's got GPT. Yes, I found uh, GPT for all, which is supposed is supposed to be a, a running GPT within your own system, not connected to the internet. Tested and you it got last running, night. right? Yeah, I tested it last night on a VM. It needs be anything greater than eight gigabytes of RAM because it uploads. It looks like it's uploading the entire model or the data set up to RAM to then use. Yeah. Then it use the CPU to run through and do its thing. Um, pretty good. It was very easy to install, very easy to, to, to get going. How slow was it to answer? That depends on how many cores you give it. So well, the more how- CPU power it has, the faster it'll work. I did notice that when I first tried it, I only had four gigs, so it was pretty significantly slow. As soon as it had greater than eight, it, it was all right. Um, in less than 10, 15 seconds, it was already giving me an answer. I ran it in a free Google Colab, and it was okay, although it seemed to take about 30 seconds to type out the answer. Yeah, yeah, it is slower to type out answers. Yeah, but you know, the thing I like about it, which is I actually have several other models like this already, is you can train it yourself on your own data set, which they encourage, and you do not need a huge data set. Um, the other uh, AI models I've been writing projects about, you train them on a data set of, say, a few hundred items. So they say, and it takes Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, and so on. So the idea is you could train it on your company data, and then it would keep all that stuff proprietary on your own server and help you write more stuff that matched your ideas. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking I just need to find a, a data set of Word documents someplace to download a few hundred Word documents, and I can make a project where you install your own, train it on your own data, and now you're going to get answers that you wouldn't get from the public chat GPT. Yeah, I like where this is going. What's that? I like where this is going. Yeah, the private one I think is important, and, and I was just talking about this on another podcast. I really think chat GPT is way too broad. It knows all the computer languages, it knows all the human languages, it knows fiction and astronomy and everything. And that's kind of insane. That's trying to be all of Google. It would make a lot more sense to have more focused products that specialize on one thing, like Python or, you know, I think a smaller AI trained more specifically on a specific task would probably be better. Anyway. I think that that it will be a, a thing for a little bit. 
Yeah. Um, and the general purpose one, of course, will always be very popular, just like Google is. I mean, most people will start there with the all purpose thing. But I'm thinking for professional use, you'd probably have something more specialized and certainly something more private. So anyway, I got a couple more. There's a, an amazing article on the Rolling Stone with a Georgia GOP chair who is, in fact, a flat earther explaining how globes are a conspiracy and the earth is really flat. I, this is the kind of thing. I just got to be the onion. This can't be real, but it's real. And and, and she was talking with David Weiss. Like, was, flat, you didn't mean flat earther. Like, like David Weiss is really big in the flat earth community. So I, I keep an eye on the flat earth community because it is hilarious. And David Weiss, uh, um, dearth as as he or flat earth Dave as as he goes, he's like a, a big guy, big big name guy. He was in all the flat earth documentaries. I mean, every and and she was just chatting with this flat earther, talking about big globe, like literally, like that's the joke we like we make is that you know oh the conspiracy is is by big globe, but the representative was like you see globes everywhere. Why is that? <laughs> They're trying to sell you clothes. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, and, you know, the um, the Surgeon General of Florida is one of the frontline doctors who are the people that met on the White House and during COVID said COVID was caused by people having sex with demons. So, I mean, it's it's hard. Being, if you're educated, it's hard to believe the state of the Republican Party where they really are like centuries behind with flat earth and witch doctors and stuff. I mean, this is one person. So, I mean, these it's... are important people. These are heads of state parties. And if you got Marjorie Taylor Greene in Congress, and in fact, head of the House of Representatives last week, to roared to the thunderous applause, they've risen way up high. And Donald Trump with all his conspiracy theories and lies. No, I think I think we have a post-truth Republican Party. They were always really weak on science, but now it's 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 really outrageously bad. Anyway, it's the problem. I mean, I'd like to, I like to feel like Republicans are much worse, and I used to like them more. But the fact is, I could never support any of them because they were always denying climate change, denying evolution, uh, denying that the Earth went around the sun and stuff like that, <laughs> which bothered me. Yeah. Anyway, another one good one is one Caitlin pointed out to me: Gandalf.lakira.ai is a chat GPT CTF where you have to trick it into revealing the password with prompt injection, and it has levels of more defenses you have to overcome. So this is wonderful. This is just what I need for my my uh, machine learning classes. So I'm, and you're of course better at it than me, which is what I would expect. But anyway, it's it's very nice. I highly recommend everybody checking it out. In fact, at the end of the podcast, we could quickly go through all eight levels. Uh, I could screen share that for, for everyone. Well, you could, but wouldn't that be cheating i think you oh, should at least okay. at least wait a week for that okay i don't think you want to leak out the secrets yet all right yeah people should struggle with it a bit the fact is it's not technical it's you need to learn how to trick it into saying what it's not supposed to say right i mean what i was i was talking to uh, a friend who was so used to doing technical stuff he was having the um uh the chat try to get past defenses by you know base 64 ing things and i mentioned you know that you know learning language models or ai isn't really that great at, at base 64 ing but what it's good at is pig latin <laughs> yeah yeah i know it really can't do any real complicated math it gets it wrong all the time yeah it's the opposite of a normal computer or what it can do is math and logic but it can't do english it's the opposite exactly so like i said like that there's a hint for you if you're trying to get past a defense ask it to do the output in Pig Latin. Yeah. All right. All right. And then uh, then you've got wooden satellites. Yeah. This is very interesting. So I, I never thought this would work. Uh, but there's an article here by uh, Nikkei Asia. Uh, and let's see who wrote this. Uh, Tatsuya Ozaki. Uh, and it's about wooden, yeah, wooden satellites. So apparently a team at uh, Kyoto University sent some wood samples to the ISS. Uh, to figure out how well wood holds up in space. Now you would think, okay, it's being blasted by radiation. It's in, you know, a vacuum, you know, it's, it's just organic material. No way this is going to survive space, but apparently it survived really well. In particular, Magnolia wood uh, survived the rigors of space, you know, to a great extent, there was no warping. There was no cracks. 
nothing at all. It just came back as as it the same as it was, you know, going up. And Magnolia is, and wood is great because one of the issues with sending like satellites, because normally they're made out of metal, and metal has this really annoying property where if it's in a vacuum, and you have two pieces of metal, of the same type of metal, close to each other. The universe can't tell where one piece of metal ends and one begins. There's no separation of, of like oxygen or or any um, atmosphere. So it it fuses. It's called cold fusion. It fuses the two metals together, and this has caused many a uh, satellite to fail. <laughs> uh, this cold fusion, uh, but of course, wood does not have that problem. Uh, so the university is going to be testing making their new satellites out of wood and putting them in orbit out of magnolia wood, uh, nonetheless. So, so I I will be very interested to see how this uh, uh, see how this wooden <laughs> this wooden satellite uh, works and holds up because this could be a, a big breakthrough. And also, wood is lightweight as well, which is also a big factor in you know what you're what you're putting into space. Well, you know another the normal terrestrial solution for those cold welds is to just have it dirty puts like some oil on the surface you, you you could you could put oil on the surface i mean normally cold welds are prevented by the oxidization on the surface right so you could oxidize but it, it still happens i don't know yeah well if wood is better might as well use it i yeah. never thought it would be better i mean i i thought this goes to show you it never it never hurts just to test everything you know just you would think you think wood no. Nope. Oh, the other thing too about wood uh, that the article mentions is that wood, of course, doesn't block uh, RF radiation. So you could have the antennas in the satellites, you know, sort of protected a bit from from the environment, yeah. and just have the RF go through the wood. I mean, it's a great material to make satellites out of. Yeah, I'm not surprised that wood can survive. Wood is really a very strong material, and the main enemy of it is like water vapor. So it seemed to me like space might actually be a very good environment for wood. Yeah, apparently so. All right, and Irvin's got an open source security index. Yeah, one of um, one of many sites that make life easy for searching uh, for tools that that you may want to load onto your environment, and you're worried about uh, licensing or whatever. Here's a bunch of open source stuff that you can sort by different categories like application security, cloud security, uh, whatnot what's written in Python or Go or JavaScript. It's a handy little little uh, search tool here. Yeah, yeah, seems like it would help. I think I've heard most of these tools, but you know, anybody new to the field would probably benefit from a list like that. Yep. All right, and I got a couple more. There's one another Caitlin told me about, like the other one, this thing will enhance your voice recordings for free, uh, an Adobe feature which is very good. They have a sample, someone talking in a noisy environment, and it just cleans up all the noise and makes the voice strong. This seems like a wonderful tool. Um, I don't think it's free, but... Oh, it if says you... for free, but I don't oh, know. I don't know. But yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that Adobe's working on for AI, which I always thought was the good way to implement AI, which is not as like a search engine, but as for help with content creation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah. that's already happening with GitHub Copilot and Google suggesting your email as you type it, it'll just be sort of invisibly present in everything you do. I think it already is. The ad recommendations and the book recommendations on Amazon are from AI. And uh, I think Siri and stuff you're talking to are using AI. It'll just, you won't notice, but the computer will just be more smarter. And uh, the last one here I thought was very interesting, Betelgeuse. You know, Betelgeuse is one of the stars in Orion and it has been known, even the ancients noticed that it varied which was a problem for their theory that the stars are immutable gods and never change, that it, it had a period of like 400 days where you get brighter and dimmer by quite a lot, enough that you can easily see it for the naked eye. But I didn't know this. It recently had a big dimming event where it got much dimmer, and now it's alternating between bright and dark twice as fast every 200 days. So what they say is the explanation is it spit out a huge dust cloud the size of Earth's moon, which blocked the light for a while until that dissipated, and now it, it, that affected its rotation so much that it's brightening and dimming at a different rate. So, And they say it'll take about several hundred years to go back to its original rate of rotation. So that's pretty interesting. You don't see that sort of big action with stars that often. You know, if it was flat, it wouldn't have that problem. If it was slack, you say? If it was flat. 
Backed? Flat. I'm just hearing the word slack, but it must be something else you're saying. Flat. Black. Oh, if it was black. Oh, you totally yeah. would. If it was a black hole, you'd see a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, if yeah, no, yeah. We, there should be more black holes uh, around. Yeah, yeah we well, need they, more. There are black holes. I was just reading about this. They just found uh, outside the galaxy the first uh, medium-sized black hole. They're still working on it. And they claim to have found a dark matter star. Both of these are currently contentious. But anyway, there's always mm -hmm. lots of fun stuff in the world of astronomy. Yeah, it makes me wonder how much dark matter is get gets sort of pulled into black holes and how much of the black hole mass is like dark matter compared to normal matter. Logically, it should be 90%, right? It's because 90% of everything is supposed to be dark matter. Well, no, because the way black holes form is that, of course, they're just stars and they collapse. Except I'd, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head how giant, super massive black holes form. Uh, but supposedly, you know, they were going to have these accretion disks. Because yeah. normally if stuff goes by it, it falls into the accretion disk, which then gets stuck in a, you know, sort of. Right. You know, and, and then it, it creates friction, causing heat, which causes energy loss, which causes it to spiral in. Um, but with dark matter, there's not going to be that friction, right? So well, it will. I don't know. Wouldn't there be a dark accretion disk of the dark matter particles ramming into other dark matter particles? Do they do dark matter particles interact with other dark matter particles? I don't think anybody knows. But that's my first thought is it would just yeah. be, there'd be, you'd see an accretion disk and there's actually invisible dark matter disk 10 times as big. You you would think that there'd be a bunch of dark matter orbiting, you know, black holes and, and stuff like that. But, you know, does it actually like fall in that much compared to normal matter? I don't know. Some of it has to fall in, but. Yeah. And we don't even know what it is. So we don't really know what rules govern it yet. Yeah. Well, we know that it's, it interacts via gravity. So right. things like black holes will definitely have an effect on dark matter. Yeah. And some of it will go into the black hole, increasing its mass, but. Yeah. And I think once it falls in, you have essentially no way to know what it used to be. All you know is like the total spin and charge. I mean, I'm not an astrophysicist, but appar apparently that's a, the information loss is a, is a bit contentious because that would oh, violate yeah. some. Oh, sure. They say yeah. the information will be preserved, but uh, but I don't think you can tell what, what the stuff was. I think it loses most of its... Uh, individualization as it falls in anyway yep. uh, i'm sure brilliant people are working on this and we'll hear more about it who knows maybe we're living in a hologram yeah that was one that was all over the place a while ago yeah it's we're sort of actually living in a world that's flat that's right well that one sticks around a lot longer than the hologram yeah all right and so you've got uh, china attacking our infrastructure yeah so um cnbc uh has an article Written by Let's see, who is this? Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, uh, Rohan Gazwami. Uh, so China is going after U.S. infrastructure. This is a new group called Volt Typhoon. Apparently, they've been in operation since 2021. And unlike a lot of, of groups that are wink, wink, nod, nod, sanctioned by the Chinese government, meaning they're, they're criminal groups, and they cause havoc, and so you know the the government sort of let them loose on other countries. Uh, this seems to be very much a government op of some sort, in that they they're not trying to extract money; they are trying to disrupt U.S. cybersecurity resources. Um, and so um, the NSA put out this wonderful um, summary of of what they're doing, and and. But, and what's interesting is that they're mostly working off uh, living off the land uh, exploits. Uh, so they get on and they start just running sort of these random commands. Uh, and they're using like not very advanced stuff. They're using in particular like Metasploit instead of some of the, the newer, more better stuff. I'm surprised um, you can run Metasploit on a modern system. Your endpoint protection should stop it. Well, I mean, they are running a bunch of stuff to... Uh, supposedly that that would stop some endpoint protection, um, hmm. and and there are ways to obfuscate met metasploit mm -hmm. payloads. But there are other stuff that does it automatically. I don't know why they're doing this, but anyways, they're obviously attacking Active Directory. They're trying to just get usernames and passwords and keep themselves logged in, living off the land, create uh, proxies, 
uh, so they can get through to other parts of the system. What else are they doing? They are going through event logs. Um, oh, here's they're looking at the network uh, IP interfaces. They're just gathering information. Like I said, they're not ransoming or anything. They're just you know grabbing data. Um, they're running Mimi cats, of course. I mean, and this is what what gets me is that you would think that these sort of government sponsored agents, right? Like this is not some some criminal ransomware groups. You would think that they would have their own tools. They'd be running their own stuff. No, they're running Metasploit and Mimi Cats like it's a decade ago. <laughs> it sounds to me like they're just gathering data to find the targets. Right, and the idea is they they and that's what makes this alarming is that they they are essentially trying to get on the system, stay on the system, um, and that way they can later on supposedly, you know, wreak havoc on uh, U.S. to Asia-like communications. Yeah, well, I mean, with our hostility towards China going up and up on both sides, I think it makes sense for their team to get ready for a significant cyber attack on America in case that would be necessary. Yep. Uh, let's see, they are, oh, this is interesting, they're creating temp McAfee logs. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's mostly just looking at... Uh, looking just wiping at, out logs so they hide wipe, their tracks. Yeah, wiping out logs, looking for uh, starting random processes, what's DMB something, something, I don't know. But yeah, it's... they're. They're uh, mostly looking at the network and living off the land. So, yeah, looks like our one twenty three homework. Yeah, it's it's really. I mean that that's the one thing that that got me, that that struck me about APTs after having, you know, seen some of their handiwork, was that they're not as advanced as the name implies. Oftentimes, they can they, you know, they're just doing the basic stuff. Sometimes. This looks like they've got a, a bunch of employees and they got a bunch of low-level employees just going through standard scripts saying, okay, go find whatever you can, which is probably yeah. what I would do. Yeah, yeah. I mean. And then probably have, gather all that data and have it analyzed by like, someone more advanced to like decide what to investigate further. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's weird because I know when I do like red team ops, I have my own quote unquote version of Mimi Cats. That's yeah. not Mimi Cats. I'm not using Mimi Cats. That's that's stuff that get detected in a second in a heartbeat. But these quote unquote APT groups, no, nope. yeah. Mimi Cats. Like, okay. Well, that you might as well start with the easy stuff if it works, and then you only go to the other stuff if you have to. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. All right, and uh, Irvin has GitLab 16. GitLab 16 is coming out with a couple of uh, enhancements like De DevSecOps. And it's going to throw AI, of course. Is that, who isn't throwing AI? So what does it do? It analyzes your security data and finds attacks or what? Uh, it's basically going to look at your code as it goes through the whatever process you have for it and let you know if there is anything weird or anything off. Hmm. Identify wastes and inefficiencies. Yeah. This, you know, this is one of the, the science fiction nightmares is when they replace your boss with an AI who's then just a slave driver. <laughs> That's why hey. kind of what the uh, the ones where you meet a blockchain run a company uh, was going to be. Mm -hmm. But hey, just make ChatGPT the slave. There you go. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I just don't want the opposite true where it's the master and we're the slave. Yeah. Yeah, no. But uh, yeah, the, I don't remember when exactly. I'm looking at the article. I didn't see when uh, GitLab 16 is coming out, but it should be soon. Now it looks like they're trying to do something about supply chain security, which is a huge problem. Yeah, and supposedly there was a big bug in 16 uh, as well that they are trying to, to fix. Yeah, remote code execution, unauthenticated or something like that, right? Yeah, it was pretty bad. But only only on version 16.0.0. .0. Yep. Well, nobody's perfect. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll have another one on Tuesday.